Hey everybody, welcome to episode six of Everything You Love. Hello and welcome, Everything You Love, Episode 6. I'm Rob Arnold. Thanks so much for joining me. On today's episode, we're just going to continue answering some cool questions. So let's go ahead and jump right back into it. Okay, first question. Big Dems wants to know, how awesome did it feel when you guys got the response you did for the one-off reunion Christmas show? I'm a grown-ass man and was in tears. Drove down from Pittsburgh. First of all, Big Dems, thanks for making the trip from Pittsburgh. Thanks to everybody who made the trip from worldwide. I heard there was people there from Europe, obviously all over the States, Canada. So that was really cool that people came out for it. Like it was such a special event, and and it was. Um, For anybody who doesn't know, my band Kamira reunited after a long hiatus on December 30th of 2017 for what used to be our annual Christmas show. And um, it, was, it was an iffy thing for us. Um, also, a little side note, it was actually the six-year anniversary since I had even stepped on stage. My last show with Kamira, or at all, was um, December 30, 2011, which I think was Kamira Christmas 12. Um, so anyways, it was a long time off, and the whole thing was a lot to put together, a lot to get all the guys talking again and on the same page and excited about about doing it. And um, once we did and, and really kind of got the ball rolling and started putting the pieces in motion to make it happen, um, we made the announcement and that was received really well. People were stoked, so that was cool. And then when tickets went on sale, they, they sold out immediately. And, and that was the best thing for us just right there. Just it, it solidified that, that people were interested and people were into it. It would have sucked if, you know, like a, a hundred people showed up or whatever, it really would have been a, a punch in the gut. But the fact that it sold out right away and we knew that it was, it had the potential to be a huge success so early on really helped us focus on preparations and rehearsal. And that was just one big thing out of the way. So that was awesome. Night of, the show went fantastic. All, everybody seemed to have a great time. Um, the production turned out really great. Kudos to everybody involved. Mark and Chris worked super hard on that. Um, band sounded good from what I could tell. It was just, it was just a lot of fun and, and really just a, a great commemoration of, of everything that we had done. And again, thanks to everybody that, that made that happen. It was, it, it was really cool, really gratifying. And yeah, quite a success. And will we do it again? That's what everybody wants to know. And I, I have to say probably there really are no plans right now um, as of November of 2019, which it is right now. Um, but, you know, I, I thought about this a little bit, and I think that a lot of that show was based on, for us, kind of the thrill of the chase. Could we put it together? Could we make it happen? And we did, and like the lions in the Serengeti, we ate, and now we're just sitting around watching the gazelle go by or whatever. But eventually we're going to get hungry again, and I got to say, you know, I mean, we talk, all those guys are talking, and I hear some stomachs growling from time to time. Mine does from time to time, and so we'll see. But again, super cool thing. Big Dems, thanks for coming out. Thanks for asking the question. Okay, next, from Dan Mitchell. I have a question about the DVD you put out with the live concert, the dehumanizing process. Who came up with the idea during Severed to do the little guitar sequence back and forth you do at the start? I think that was really different and looked great. Well, thanks, Dan. I'm going to say that that was probably Jim's idea. Uh, Jim loved Kiss and all the choreography of uh, those 80s bands when they do moves in unison and everything. It may have been Mark's idea. I'm not sure. I should have asked Mark, but I'm going to guess Jim. And for those of you who don't know what he's talking about, um, we used to do this guitar thing where we'd swing back and forth in the beginning of the song Silence, which we moved to Severed. I'll get, that, get into that in a second. Um, and you can see that <clears throat> in our um, Tilburg performance um, in the Netherlands from the uh, Dehumanizing Process DVD, the live video that came along with that. So Silence 
is a song that um, is on our first EP, This Present Darkness. And we would do this thing at the beginning of it, the, uh, the guitarists go dig it in, 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 dig it in. And uh, we would swing our guitars in unison from left to right. Dig it in, dig it in, dig it in, dig it in. Myself, Jim, and Matt at the front of the stage, and we do that. And I guess people like that, and uh, it, it was cool. So then, um, as we started phasing out silence from the set list, and we, we came into the pass out of existence cycle, we thought, oh, well, we still want to maintain that thing, but we don't want to play the whole song, so we'll tag it on the beginning of a different song. And Severed ended up being a perfect song for that. So we could do the intro from Silence right into the song Severed. Uh, so, just funny story about that. Years later, we were in San Francisco at this uh, club called The Pound, and Dino from Fear Factory was there. And uh, maybe we were on tour with Fear Factory, I'm not sure. Maybe he was just hanging out, I'm not sure. Um, but anyways, he had said that he'd like to uh, jam that tune with us on stage. He was going to come on stage with us and do the, the swinging guitar thing. So, awesome. We're, uh, we're backstage rehearsing, warming up for it and everything. And uh, this is a story that, that a lot of Camara fans may know. Um, Dino's warming up, and he's, he sounds so awesome playing all these Fear Factory riffs. And I'm like, dude... How do you how do you sound how do you pick that tight or whatever like that and he just points to his hand, insinuating that it's all in the hand. So then we adopted that and anytime anybody asks us about how we play a certain thing, we're just like, or we do that to each other in practice, like, oh, how do you get that squeal? How do you play that? You know, sort of thing. Funny, but anyways, so we're backstage and we're going over this and Dino asks Jim, he's like, all right, so we definitely start on the left side and go to the right. Dig it, dig it in, dig it, dig it in, dig it, dig it in. Jim's like, yeah. We confirm it, everything like that. Dino obviously didn't want to look like a fool and go the wrong way. It's his first time doing it and everything like that. So anyways, we get up there, get to the song. Dino comes up, gets a nice ovation, all that. Start the song. For some reason, Jim goes the wrong way. Dino sees this and thinks that he's going the wrong way, so he starts following Jim. So now you got Matt and I on the ends going one way, Jim and Dino in the, in the middle going the other way. Every It turns into this, this huge... Cluster and and everybody's doing it their own way and it was this huge thing at the end. Anyways, at the at the end of the the show, then Dino's like, "Dude, what happened?" Blah, blah blah. Obviously, you know, he thought he looked like a fool, but or something. But it, it was all good. Everybody had a great time, but certainly a funny thing. Um, so yeah, hey, and I tell you what, if uh, the opportunity ever arises for us to play that tune again, I'm sure we'll do the swinging guitar thing. Okay, up next we've got Kyle Kiesler who says, Hey Rob, my question is do you use an overdrive to boost your amp or are you just using the amp to get the tones you get? I'm currently running a TS9 in a clean boost in my chain on my 6505 Plus. <clears throat> Well, Kyle, it's actually a question I get fairly often. Um, a lot of people want to know whether I'm, I'm using a boost or if my amps are modded and what kind of tubes I'm using, things like that. Um, the answer, and I don't think a lot of people are going to like it because I know people are looking for the secret to, to a great sound, and so am I all the time. I'm always on the hunt for a great sound too. But the fact is, my tone, the Chimera tone, is just a straight 6505 plus no mods, uh, no boost, never use any of those TS9s or any of those Ibanez pedals, anything like that. Um, I don't even know what kind of tubes are in the head. It's just the ones that it comes with, and that's just the way I like it. I like the stock head. I like the way it sounds. I like the way it feels, performs, everything like that. I've never thought that I needed anything more out of the head. It's just good the way it is. Flip it on, crank it out. The one thing a, a high output amp like that needs is noise suppression and uh, I've always recommended the ISP decimator we went through phases with the MXR smart gate the boss NS2s and then settled on the the ISP decimator because it's one knob sounds great still gives you sustain does the job gets rid of that dun dun, ooh, dun, dun ooh, that all the high gain amplifiers uh, have in between them you sound more professional when you don't have all that feedback in there anyways so no no mods no boosts anything like that just a straight up amp 
All right, and that brings us to Mark W, who wants to know what I would say my favorite tour was and why, and who was on the bill with us. Huh? My favorite tour and why? Hmm. Ooh, so many great tours over the years. Supporting Slayer in 01. The OzFest Tour in 03. Slipknot Tour in 04. Ah, some killer headlining tours over the years. Um, those are gratifying, but if it comes down to it, my favorite tour of all time has to be Disturbed in 09. It was Chimera, Lacuna Coil, Kill Switch Engage, and Disturbed. And I mean, there is just something about playing arenas that just feels right to me. I tell you, playing basketball arenas, parking your bus inside the arena underground, fantastic catering, huge stages, PAs, lights, awesome crowds, team locker rooms as your dressing rooms, multiple showers, you need laundry done. Eh. Anything you need, it's it's just fantastic. That's that's what I feel like I strived for my whole touring career to get to that, you know, because that's that's where the big boys play. All the big bands, you know, they 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 have that type of lifestyle, and that's what I wanted to get to. And so I kind of feel like maybe the Disturbed tour was was the pinnacle of that for us, the closest we got, because having that yourself, having that be your crowd, is the ultimate pinnacle in my mind. Seattle, Live Ship Engine Purge 1989, the Metallica video, just that video was, was my concert bible of what I wanted, like, just in life. And uh, I feel like, even again, even though it wasn't our crowd, I got close to that with Disturbed, playing those shows. And Disturbed's crowd was totally awesome, just very receptive. Oh, and Disturbed themselves, the coolest guys, super nice, super pro. I mean, those are the big boys just doing it right. Um, they, they're living the life, and... <laughs> I thank him for, for bringing us along. That was so awesome. I remember the phone call from Mark saying, oh, dude, we got on a Disturbed tour. I was like, no way. And I didn't even know what to expect at that time. I just knew it was going to be big time, and it was. Definitely my favorite. If I could time travel back and do any tour, that'd be the one. Disturbed. Thank you. And for the final question of the day, Jeff Larch wants to know what it was like breaking out of the Cleveland metal scene. He says, my band is trying to do the same and I'd love to hear your advice on how you did it. Hmm. Well, Jeff, the odds are against you and that's a tough place to start from. You know, so number one is just having good music. Let's just assume you have good music. Let's assume that there's a buzz going on about your band in your hometown. And I mean, because good music is everything. It, if your music sucks, it's just no, one, you, no one's going to take you seriously. You're never going to go anywhere. So you need great music. How do you know if you have great music? Well, you don't. So you just hope you do. And you push in every other direction that you can. And um, it, as vain as it sounds, you know, image plays a big part in it too. You know, if you're, if you're a metal band, you maybe want to look a little bit metal, metal, or at least look consistent within your in, within your band. You can't have three guys look one way and then one guy just be some doofus. You know, like you want to give people a reason to take you seriously. At least that's how I think about it. I mean, everybody in Slayer looks cool. You know, I mean, would Slayer be Slayer if one guy looked like a clown? I, I mean, I don't know. Um, that's that's a debate in its own but so let's assume you got that down a little bit um, you're already playing around your town you're getting a little buzz going the music's cool you're knocking on doors trying to create opportunities you're pushing hard spending money that's a big thing spend money you know to, to do the right things have good gear don't show up to clubs with broken symbols and and amps that don't work or whatever you know I mean you want to present yourself as professional at least that's what we did you know, and, and that's what I believe in, and that more opportunities will come that way. Um, those things, and then and then trying to take advantage of opportunities that arrive because you're doing those those little things in the early part of the game. Um, for instance, early on for us, 
Mark got out there and tried to create opportunities by trying to trade shows with, with other guys in the scene, uh, you know, from, from, from regional bands and things like that. So I remember our first show in Syracuse, New York, piling in the van, going out there, playing at some VFW hall that we had to travel through the woods to get to, reading like handmade signs, show this way and stuff, you know, like to get through these woods. We get to this venue, we just play on the floor, no stage, um, you know, I don't know, 40 people there or something like that. But the big thing is, is we made an impression. We played like there were 400 people there and we gave it our all. We, it, it didn't matter to us then. We weren't jaded in any way yet at that point. And then we gave it our all and we made an impression and people talked about us. A um, little, little while later, I remember this, this show. It was one show in Massachusetts and it was a huge snowstorm. And I remember thinking, oh man, we're going to drive 10 hours in this snowstorm uh, just for this one show in some high school gymnasium. But we did it. And we battled through the snow, all of us in one van with all the gear, no trailer even yet at this point, just packed in. Again, doing what you got to do. But we get there, and it's it's just put on by a bunch of kids, like like I mean, like hardcore kids like we were at the time. And uh, you know, they're like, "Oh, sorry, you guys are late. You know, you uh, you, you can't play." And we're like, "Dude, you know, we drove all this way, you know." And they're like, "All right, we'll let you play three songs." So we get up there and we play three songs, and we made an impression. I remember that show. I remember later in the night too. This band goes on, this is cool, this band goes on, and I, I remember feeling a lot of anticipation within the crowd. We had already played, and um, you know, everybody was looking forward to this band coming up. And uh, they start out, and this, this big guy strolls out on stage, super smooth, evening pants on, just starts destroying the place. Everybody dancing, moshing hard, loving this, and they were a band called Blood Has Been Shed. And the singer was a guy that a lot of you have probably heard of, a guy named Howard Jones, which went on to, to front Kill Switch Engage. Um, Justin, the singer of Kill Switch, was also the drummer. Justin, sorry, the, uh, the drummer of Kill Switch was also the drummer of Blood Has Been Shed at that time. Anyways, they killed it. They were awesome. I knew that night that Howard was special, and sure enough, he went on to do something great. Um, but again, just fought through, played that show, sold a bunch of tapes, probably stickers, maybe some shirts and stuff like that. Um, another thing... A little later then, through more things like this, got an opportunity to, we got a manager, a guy named Tom Hazard, I'm sure a lot of you guys have, have heard of, that, that helps a lot of up and coming bands, you know, try to do their thing. And um, he was managing us at the time and he said, hey, I got you guys a showcase out in LA here. A showcase is where you kind of just play for, for labels. I mean, maybe some, some friends in the area. It, I mean, anybody can come or whatever, but it's primarily set up just so that a few labels can come out to one place and see you play. So, I, so of course, we're excited. Oh my God, we're going to play for, for some labels here. And um, so that's at the Troubadour in LA. And he's like, yeah, I set it up for a couple weeks from now. So pile in the van with all the gear. Again, no trailer. Drive out to California, play this one show, drive back home the next morning. So it's, it's making those sacrifices, doing those type of things that other people may turn down. Like, oh, we can't do that. Oh, I can't get off work. Oh, you know, whatever. If you couldn't get off work, you're out the door. And, and so that's the type of attitude and mentality it takes. Final story. We're the opening band in Toledo, Ohio some night. A tour for a tour. Spine Shank, Nonpoint, Boiler Room. And uh, we're just the opening band. The, the tour didn't know us. They didn't know who we were. Kamir was just the opening band at the show. And um, we made an impression on, on the Spine Shank guys. The, uh, Mike Sarkeesian must have said to Mark, hey, I thought you guys were cool. So Mark says, jokingly almost, hey, take us on the rest of the tour. And Mike's kind of like, all right. So he calls his manager, who ended up becoming our manager, and says, hey, I want you to put this band on the bill. Take this band, Kamira. They were cool. And I want them to, to open the rest of the tour. So... Scott, their manager, our manager, probably pulling out his hair, you know, got to call agents, call other managers, all the paperwork's done, the promoters, I mean, the tour's been set up for weeks, months, all that, and now they got to go and put this band up, but sure enough, they did it. And so, all of a sudden, we have to start a tour the next morning, get two cars together, got a trailer this time, and go ahead and start a nationwide tour, that, and then in two cars, go out, did those shows, and all those things, just every little thing we did added to some great opportunity. Granted, we had a ton of luck, and that's really what it comes down to. You just do all the things you can do, be as professional as you can, sound as good as you can, do the right things, play the right cards, take advantage of opportunities, try to make opportunities for yourself, create them, be cool guys, and 
that's how you break out. Can you do it? We'll see. I wish you luck. All right. Well, that's going to do it for this episode, guys. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed making it for you. Uh, I always love answering good questions. And if you got some, feel free to fire them at me. If you like this video, please consider giving it a like, maybe dropping your first like. Doing so helps other people see this video, which really helps me out a lot. Thank you so much to everybody who's subscribed so far. And if you haven't subscribed yet, please consider doing so, hitting that notification bell so that you know every time I publish a new video. And if you are subscribed and haven't hit that bell, it's never too late to do so. I like to hit the notification bell for all the channels that I subscribe to. So I get an email or a notification every time they release a new video. And I just think that's a cool feature. Uh, you can get in touch with me on all the socials at Rob Arnold World. You can also check out my Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash Rob Arnold World. And Patreon is an online community where you can get directly involved in helping the, the creators that you like create their music and their videos and things like that, which is what I'm going for. And finally, to close this out here, I'd like to show you a sample of something I just recently created for my patrons over on my page there. And it's a, an exclusive video lesson for the stick a knife in your enemy riff from Comatose. So check that out coming up here. And if you like that, I'm going to be doing a lot more lessons like that and guitar related stuff over at my Patreon page. Again, that's patreon.com slash Rob Arnold World. Thanks so much for watching, everybody. Hope to see you all on episode seven. Cheers. What's up? Comatose. Check it out. Four. Four, three. Five, four, six, five. Open. Power chord on four. Five, four. Power chord on three. Four, three. Power chord on two. Three, two. So starting on four, there's no muting. Everything is muted except for the power chords, which are the accents. There's a simple pattern to this whole thing once you get it, but everything muted except for the accents. And then there's that part uh, when, the, when it, the key change, when it goes up a whole step. If you got any questions, cheers.